morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to this uh, STARS webinar. I'm Tony Schoenberg, I'm the Executive Chairman of uh, STARS. STARS is a global platform for dialogue. Uh, we discuss developments and trends which will impact the society as a whole and our businesses in the next couple of years. Today, we are continuing the important webinar series on sustainability. We have the great privilege to talk to Dr. Janes Potocznik. Janes is the co-chair of the UNEP International Resource Panel, and he is the former new commissioner for science and research and for the environment. Janes, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining this session. We very much look forward to your insights on risks and opportunities of uh, resource management. I want to introduce you now to our moderator, uh, Dr. Gordana Kierens. Gordana is a former professor of international business. She is now managing partner of her consulting company in Croatia. One focus of her work is uh, the circular economy. And in addition to that, I'd also like to say that she's the president of the STARS Southeast Asia, Southeast, Southeast Europe, sorry, alumni chapter. Rodana designed this important series of uh, six uh, webinars on sustainability and the circular economy. And she's also moderating these sessions. Rodana, thank you very much again. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for the introduction. And good morning, good afternoon from me as well. Um, to, of course, warm welcome to Yanis. Um, we are very pleased to have you and a warm welcome to our audience from around the world. We, this series is called a Multifaceted Path to Sustainability. As the name indicates, there is no one path we have to look at sustainability from different perspectives. Today, we take the opportunity to talk about resources. In the last seminar, in the last webinar, we looked at systems thinking from a theoretical perspective. This time, this is a more applied approach to the resource system and the challenges we are facing uh, in this system. So, Yanis, um, I would like to start with uh, my first question. And of course, you as the audience are invited to join in with your questions. You have the Q&A sec uh, opportunity down below. Um, Yanis, at the World Circular Economy Forum in Helsinki in May this year, you made a statement, you were a keynote speaker there. Um, you re I recall you saying, we speak about the circular economy is something in the future. We either transition to the circular economy or we have no future. Do you mind elaborating a little bit on this statement? Actually, I was saying the future will be green or there will be no future, but yeah, uh, circular economy, um, it's as you will, here also from the presentation which I will do, it's for me a kind of something very much natural because uh, uh, it's it's actually the oldest concept on the earth because all nature is organized in a circular way. So nothing is lost, everything has its purpose. So the real question behind it's really, do we consider ourselves as part of nature? And uh, I think it's pretty no brainer that uh, organizing ourselves in a way that we do not uh, lost uh, precious natural resources, uh, which are, uh, of course, limited. It's uh, a logical and uh, important way to go, uh, because using those resources, as you will hear, uh, has quite a lot of uh, side effects and consequences. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have been in this area um, of resource management for over a decade, if I recall reading I mean, your profile. So you know um, a lot about the topic and we are keen on, on listening more about that. So our my next question would be around, around that. As you said, all our resources come from this one planet. I mean, there are some even some reports saying the majority of our resources comes from the planet, which begs me begs the question to ask where does the rest come from? Of course, everything comes from this 
one planet. There is no other option. There is no planet B. So uh, for us, it's uh, interesting to see from your experience over a decade in this area, how things have changed, how the resource uh, consumption has accelerated exponentially. But also for our viewers who work for companies, how can companies brace themselves for these challenges? And I think you mentioned you have a presentation about this. Yeah, quite a long one. <laughs> But it's a lot to share, yeah. so I'm looking forward. It's a forward. lot to share. Yeah, I will be, uh, Gordon and I will be just start sharing my screen. And uh, I think we will have quite a lively debate after that, because I firmly believe it's uh, challenging enough to be uh, to be attractive for the discussion. Uh, I would just like to have your confirmation that everything is okay on the screen. I can see. Okay, super. So let's start uh, by leading you through the story of resources, but uh, starting with a simple thing, nothing is new and unknown. Unfortunately, it's just happening faster than expected. So if I go very quickly through the poly crisis in which we are living, um, you know, the population growth, we will be more than 9 billion in the mid of the century. But just to remind you that in 1972, when the Club of Rome, by the way, I'm also the member of Club of Rome, uh, has released their limits to growth, there was 3.8 billion, so less than half of the population which is currently on the planet 50 years ago. The world reaches 1% have more than twice as much wealth as 6.9 billion of the people and 22 richest men have more wealth than 326 million women in Africa. We throw away one third of the food we produce. More than half of the cities which are expected to be built till 2050 still do not exist. And China has just in three years use more cement than USA in the whole 20th century. In the biodiversity area, WWF report uh, is basically saying that our planet's wildlife populations uh, have seen a 69% drop on average since 1970 in the last 50 years. A million of plastic bottles are bought every minute. 9% of that plastic is recycled, 12 incinerated, so actually around 80% is still ending in landfills or environment. And you have seen what are the consequences of the COVID. Uh, so there are possibilities uh, like, uh, like we have faced, which actually force the whole population and economy in the lockdown. I will not talk about climate change because I guess there is no need to convince you after this recent summer, which we have faced. So this is actually the picture of the recent summer. So it's pretty... It's pretty worrying, as I said at the beginning, the things are unfortunately going faster than one would expect. And if you look to those who are benefiting most, so that's on the, uh, that's on the upper part of the, of the screen, and those who are most vulnerable due to the climate change, we see that it's pretty unbalanced uh, story. So uh, that was a very nice uh, invitation from the European Investment Bank, uh, to the uh, semi, to the uh, conference European conference on community disaster preparedness the elements of disaster so uh, training for the disaster preparedness is here which means that we basically know what is happening we were already 1972 when the limits to growth were released we were warned that unlimited material growth and consumption on a finite planet would eventually lead to the collapse and decline. And the recent publication, which is called Earth for All, it's one year old, uh, it's basically talking about two potential scenarios. One is too little too late, and I guess it's too little too late to talk also about that. Uh, the other is the giant leap, the fastest economic transformation in history. In, and for me, two most interesting outcomes from that uh, uh, scenario are basically two. One is that we will see the negative social tipping points before severe environmental tipping points will be reached. And the other is that even in the giant leap scenario, climate change stabilizes only at below two degrees. So uh, we are practically already above 1.5 degree and it's very difficult to talk seriously about that anymore. So the future has already arrived and unfortunately it is called present. Which leads me to the main challenges, uh, and here I will go. Uh, I will start in in my own country, Slovenia. Some of you might have heard about our most famous philosopher, Slavoj Žižek. 
he was in his own way very nicely saying it's clear that we are approaching the ecological and digital apocalypse, but we should not lose nerves. And he continued even more in his own way. Everything under heaven, it's in utter chaos. The situation, it's excellent. But let us look uh, where actually the problems, uh, the problems lie. So I'm pretty sure that some of you have heard about this donut approach. Donut approach talks about basic human needs, which are inner part of the circle, which are expanding, and of course, outer planetary limits and boundaries. The green part, it's a safe operating space in which we are living, and it's unfortunately shrinking. So when you look uh, to the evaluations, this was the beginning, but the recent one is actually this. It was published just a few days ago, where for the first time, all six boundaries have been evaluated. Uh, all nine have been uh, evaluated, and we are crossing already six planetary boundaries. So the situation, when you look at it, in, of course, in national context, it's very much different from Malawi, China, Belgium, Australia. But what is interesting on this is that actually Belgium and Australia have the same per capita GDP, but they are very much differently surpassing the planetary boundaries. So it could be different. And if we would look to the, if we would try to pack all the countries of the world uh, in, in one slide, one could say there are countries which are, of course, uh, not meeting yet social thresholds, but not also transgressing planetary boundaries. On the other hand, there are fast developing countries which are already transgressing planetary boundaries, but not yet entirely meeting the social thresholds. And then there are developed countries which are, of course, uh, enormously transgressing planetary boundaries, but where people are living well and where they are meeting the social thresholds. Club of Rome has nicely explained that we have moved from some called empty world, which was dominated by nature, to the full world, which is now dominated by humans. And in the empty world, it was labor and infrastructure, which were the limiting factors of human well-being, while in the full world, it is actually natural resources and environmental sinks which are limiting factors of our human well-being. So even if we want to talk only economy of the future, you can't do that without talking about natural resources and environmental things. So for the first time in human history, we actually face the emergence of a single tightly coupled human socio-ecological system of planetary scope. So we are more interconnected and interdependent than ever we have been our generation. Just think about everything which is connected with the climate change, which was connected with COVID, which is connected uh, with internet, which is connected with global trade. And I could continue. And even in the even the Second World War was not yet basically the the world uh, uh, so uh, connecting a planetary scope. It was more regional wars around the whole world. But in essence, with the emergence of the nuclear weapon, of course, this became a kind of a planetary scope threat. So what does that mean? It means that our individual and collective responsibility for the future has enormously increased. And we touch for a moment uh, the economic story. So I will try to present you through the Inclusive Wealth Index. Inclusive Wealth Index have basically three components. One is production capital, which is this gray dotted line here. It's actually very close to this solid gray line, which is actually GDP per capita. So production capital and GDP capital, uh, GDP capital per capita are in a way kind of uh, synonyms moving in the same direction. Then we have human capital per capita, which was in those uh, a bit more than 20 years, uh, which were analyzed practically standing still, while, as you have seen, production capital has practically doubled in that period. And then finally, on that slide, you have also natural capital per capita, which was in that period deteriorating for approximately 40%. So conclusion that the growth of GDP in the last decades was to a large extent achieved also on the basis of depleting natural capital and via that, of course, indebting future generations, it's not so difficult to reach. If I would try to simplify the, uh, the whole economic story, uh, I'm an economist, by the way, then 
uh, then, as you know, producers and consumers on the markets re behave rationally. And uh, we get uh, market signals on the basis of which we decide what and how we will go in in majority of the cases. And if I would try to translate the previous page, then one could say production capital is overvalued and overrewarded. Human capital is undervalued and underrewarded, and natural capital is not valued at all uh, in many cases. And if we are sending those signals to producers and consumers, then expecting from that economic, social, and environmental balance, it's simply unreasonable. So uh, this leads me now to the story of the International Resource Panel and to the resources and their importance. Let me start with something which is not really the IRP, but still, this is the biomass of animals. And you could see here on the bottom humans. So we are minor part of the biomass of animals. But if you compare the biomass of animals with biomass of life, then you can see here plants, uh, uh, viruses, uh, fungi, uh, bacteria. Animals are pretty small part of that uh, picture. But that's actually not the message which I want to give you. If you compare this global biomass altogether with anthropogenic mass, that's the mass which was created by humans, concrete, bricks, aggregates, metals, asphalt, then we find out that this is already bigger and this column is higher than the all global biomass. And estimates are that uh, this right column will be triple size of the green column till 2040. So these are the trends. And uh, already plastic kingdom today, it's a double size of animal kingdom on the planet. So when we talk, and Gordon actually mentioned at the beginning, uh, when we talk about resources, everything is extracted from the earth. Actually, when we talk about that, we distinguish between biomass, metals, fossil fuels, and non-metallic minerals. This is in exactly all extracted from the earth, and we call it materials. But on the top of that, you have also water and land as part of the natural resources. So let us look on the developments of materials, everything extracted from the earth in the last 50 years. Global material use has more than tripled. Per capita almost doubled, which means that majority of that tripling can be aligned with economic growth, but important factor, it's absolutely also population growth. And finally, this material productivity, that's the solid line which you see here, that's actually the efficiency of the use of materials per unit of GDP. It's growing in all the countries. How it's possible that for, from the year 2000, it actually start to fall in there and then stagnate? It's possible because we have faced a structural shift. We, consumers, have been before buying products which were produced in more resource efficient countries like Europe or Japan. And now many of those products are actually produced and we are using, buying them, uh, but they are produced in resource uh, less efficient countries like for example, Indonesia or China or India. Uh, and that's uh, leading to this interesting effect which we are seeing. When we were looking to environmental impacts of materials in the value chain, Conclusions were that more than 90% of global land-related biodiversity loss and water stress are connected to that. And we can easily see that majority is basically connected to the biomass. So if you want to solve the problem of, uh, uh, of biodiversity loss or water stress, you definitely need to talk about agriculture and uh, forestry. Then 50% of the global climate change and one third of the air pollution health impacts, which uh, when we continue our analysis, uh, our models are telling us that if we continue business as usual, uh, global material consumption is predicted to double by 2060 again, which leads us to the pretty simple intellectual conclusion that if we really want to still grow our well-being, economic activity in the future, the only way which is possible and logical is that we decouple that the growth of that from the use of natural resources and that both is decoupled from environmental impacts. 
Now we will shift from the solutions, from the uh, problems and from the situation to try to unpack it and see how would it be possible that we would basically better, uh, better uh, manage uh, that kind of uh, challenges which we are facing. Which leads me to the circular economy. Circular economy should be actually seen as an instrument for delivering the coupling I was talking about. But uh, if you take into account also the explanation, which I was mentioning at the beginning where when Gordon asked me, we can see it also as a part of a bigger picture of this economic, societal, and cultural transformation, which is needed if we want to deliver in European context, European Green Deal, but in a global context, sustainable development goals. There are many different ways how one can explain the circular economy, and there are many different layers of circular economy, from uh, recycling strategies up to reuse, re repair, uh, refurbish, remanufacture, repurpose recycling strategies, to reduce strategies in manufacture and use, to finally the strategies which actually focus on refusing, rethinking, which are, because they are not too economically attractive, often overlooked, but they are crucial for effectiveness. Actually, they are not economically attractive from the first side. If we are starting from the logic of what is important is just to put new, uh, new products on the market. But in essence, there are other possibilities, and I will also talk about that. Because we humans actually don't need cars. We need mobility. We don't need light bulbs. We need light. We don't need chairs. We need to sit. We don't need refrigerators. We need chilled and healthy food. We don't need CDs. We want to listen to the music. We don't need pesticides. We want healthy plants. So if you follow that logic, then dematerialization, rethinking the ownership of many of the things where we are somehow very much biased that we want to own the things, in particular, my generation, the young generation, it's things are different. And also complementing the well-accepted efficiency policies with the sufficiency policies, it's a necessity. So the core question which we are asking ourselves in the International Resource Panel is this one. How can we meet human needs in most energy and most resource-efficient way? In trying to unpack that, we have, with a group of friends, created something which we call a system change compass. We basically uh, ask a very simple question. So ambition of European Green Deal is very high. By the way, this is focused on Europe, but solutions are pretty much the same for all the countries in the world. So we, we actually concluded that ambition is very high, but that we have some uncertainties when it comes to implementation, which I will try to unpack a bit later. And that's why we have created something, a kind of a system which we call a system change compass. I will really briefly lead you through that and I would just advise you to take it in your hands or better to take it, to look at it in the comp and analyze more in detail and you will find it quite useful. So we have identified 10 major redefinitions which would be in the, in the global economic system needed if we would want to go into a sustainability direction. And for each of those 10 redefinitions, we have proposed three uh, policy orientations, so 30 in total. And then from this economic environment, we shifted to the real economy, where we looked to the provisioning systems. I will explain that a bit more in detail. So we don't talk about sectors here, but provisioning systems. What are the needs of humans? And finally, we landed with some 50 plus uh, investment opportunities, which are aligned with this policy and real economy approach explained before. Just to give you one example. So we talked uh, about as number one, as redefining prosperity, which is from prosperity, which is defined by aggregate economic growth, to prosperity, which is defined by fair and social economic development and well-being for all. Which means that what are the free policy orientations which we are there, uh, uh, which we are there introducing? One is the policy attention, which is currently going more or less to the wealth creation, which is right and it should stay, should be complemented also with the focus on wealth distribution. So that economic transition more contributes to the equality and social fairness. As you have heard, 
these tipping points will be reached before environmental tipping points. So you can't do environmental transition without simultaneously focusing on social transition. Nothing which is not acceptable will not be acceptable. We have, create, we have to create conditions for social acceptance of the necessary transition. Also, because some of the things I was talking about uh, when it comes to the uh, when it comes to uh, economic incentives coming to producers and consumers will absolutely impact also on the costs and uh, and prices on the markets. And finally, one a bit more concrete is that uh, that part of the income based taxes should be actually uh, replaced by resource based taxes to address both at the same time resource as well as social policy targets. So this was the first one. The second was then redefining natural use, then redefining progress, redefining matrix, redefining competitiveness, incentives, consumption, finance, redefining governance, and finally redefining leadership. All of those, it's well explained in the compass and has few pages of explanation and also how the things would need to be done. And all of them, as mentioned, is accompanied with free policy recommendations. Which leads me now to the second part, which is the real economy, where again, since it is the use of natural resources, which is driving the triple planetary crisis, we simply need to ask ourselves, which provisioning system, which human needs are most resource intensive? And those are nutrition, housing, mobility, and daily functional needs. And then the second question, which we asked ourselves is, okay, these are direct human needs, but there are supporting, enabling systems, which are actually allowing that we meet human needs. And this is using nature as solutions, so direct nature-based solutions. Then of course, the energy, of course, materials and innovation digitalization. So this is very simple system, which of course, it's all very much interconnected. So focusing on those areas, there are many more human needs, for example, culture, sport, and so on, but they are not so much resource intensive. And I think it's essential if we want to be effective to focus on those who are, which are using most resources and actually causing also most, uh, uh, most indirect uh, uh, effects, which, which we would like to get to avoid. And on the basis of that, as mentioned, we have proposed some 50 plus investment opportunities, which might be for you as uh, somebody who is connected uh, with uh, business uh, very much as a kind of blueprint leading to the sustainable direction where actually we would advise that our attention should go. So if I summarize it, we have 10 redefinitions, eight economic ecosystems inside that, then all the investments which are needed and each of those redefinitions free policy advice for each economic system, three to five specific economic policy orientations, and also then a nice explanation of the investment opportunities. Which leads me now to the why this is not happening, which are the main blind spots? And I will look to that question a bit more through the climate change in focus. The first is that simply public leaders, practically many others also, lack capacity of system change visions and uh, also knowledge how to translate into their concrete policy investment structures, which ends, unfortunately, then in conflicting silo policy logic. And this silo policy logic, it's actually hindering the real transformation. So if we look just to the example of the climate change, we, we approach more or less in that way. So we look to the carbon emissions and we want zero carbon emissions 2050, whatever it will cost. We need to have zero carbon emissions 2050, of course, but not whatever it will cost. So we need to see what is the best and most efficient way, which is, for example, addressing also other questions from health, inequality, resource scarcity, because this will enable on one hand, quicker and easier carbon transition, but on the other hand, it will not open new wounds, which we will have to uh, actually deal uh, later. The second is lack of drivers and pressures perspective. So we lack the focus on systemic natural resource use and management, which I'm trying to explain, as well as market signals, which is leading consumers and producers behavior. 
So one example, currently we talk a, a lot about material needs for the energy transition and international energy agency is basically clearly putting the figures on the table that reaching net zero by 2050 will require about six times today critical mineral use in 2040. That is on the supply side, but on the demand side, so when we use electricity, for example, for electric vehicles, electric vehicles use close to 10 times the material of conventional cars. But if we look to the approach currently of practically all public institutions, governments, they are mainly focusing on how to provide necessary critical raw materials with highest environmental and social standards, and also geographically disperse them so that security is higher, which is good and needed. They focus also on the products which contain critical raw materials directly and ask for, uh, uh, for uh, actually uh, using them in a circular way. So basically recycling is more or less the, the focus, but none of them is actually looking how we would in the first place optimize delivery of resource intensive human needs and via that actually make the need for energy lower and the need for critical raw materials lower and all in all make the overall transition actually viable, not looking only from economic perspective what is needed and how to get it, but also simultaneously doing also the, uh, the whole story of the decoupling and via that addressing also the uh, addressing also the environmental questions, which leads me then to the confusing market signals. I have explained them before. Current market signals simply do not incentivize sustainable resource use, quite the, the opposite. Uh, so sending policy signals one way, saying behave responsibly, and then we have many laws, many regulation, but unfortunately market signals sending us in another way is just creating confusion on the markets, not to mention a lot of lobbying by companies that fear to lose the profitable markets. So I think it's simply time to stop signaling to producers that destroying natural capital is free of charge. And it's time to stop contradictory messages to consumers where we're asking them, you should behave more responsibly, but on the other hand, sorry, you will pay double price if you want to have, for example, a food which with a low environmental impact instead of the reverse. This is uh, the most typical thing which is telling you everything. I call it the global hypocrisy indicator. Uh, this is uh, this are data from IMF. So fossil fuel subsidies were the highest ever in the last year, in the year 2022, when the whole world is basically talking about how we should get rid of the fossil fuels. Which leads me to the last, uh, uh, to the last thing which uh, uh, needs to be addressed. That is that majority of our in initiatives are actually giving attention to cleaning up the supply side, to making the supply side more efficient and more environmentally friendly. And we are entirely lacking almost the attention to the demand side. Who is actually consuming the products which we are producing? Because those who are consuming are actually pretty much those who are surpassing the, pla the planetary boundaries and living out of the safe operating space. So if you would look also to demand side, it would be easier to find solutions on the supply side. And on the other hand, it's also a very serious question leading more to the responsibility and equity. So if we would look to, uh, to this, so we will talk about energy more or less. And rightly so, because it's the most important. But if you if you would look here, the fugitive emissions from energy production are less than 6%. Majority is energy of use in the buildings, in the transport, in industry. So basically, our, our first question, which we should ask is how to make that red circle smaller. And then also the solutions in transition to the renewable energy would be easier and not lead us to some potential lock-ins. So we must stop ignoring the inherent wastefulness of, our, wastefulness of our production and consumption systems. For example, if you would clean the steel industry, which is absolutely necessary, but not ask yourself how much of that steel is used in empty or underutilized cars or empty houses, of course, 
you do not answer to the full question and to the full challenge. And it's extremely important that we integrate that kind of approach with sufficiency policies and consumption and material footprints also in our thinking. Why? Because it is the only way to get the global south into serious F efforts of we will be only locked into loss and damage discussion in the climate talks. So we need to ask those questions and we need to introduce the tools which will be leading us. So in summary, if we want to avoid the extinction of elephants in nature, we must extinct elephants in our rooms. And I was basically talking about those. Just four slides about uh, where our next global resource outlook will be leading us in the International Resource Panel. So we will be looking at resource use through provisioning systems. So we will basically use the logic which I have explained. Why that's so important? Because it allows from economic perspective and incentivize the cross-sector innovation and also shifts to a more future fit business models which are leading to the reduction of resource use and deliver multiple benefits for people and the planet. So this will be type of uh, data which you will be, which you can expect from our next uh, report. So this is the climate impacts, and you can see how they are structured according to provisioning systems. And these are the biodiversity impacts. And you can easily see from this picture that when you talk about biodiversity, it's pretty much about the uh, the human needs which are connected to the food system. And if I just give you one example, what is the difference if you go one way or another way and I will use the mobility system? So this is our current approach, optimizing sectoral output, normally uh, the car production, transport sectors, measuring, aiming to maximize GDP, replacing combustion with electric vehicles, making them available and affordable to all. That's the conclusion from climate cops. And this leads to increased infrastructure, land use, economic and population growth, additional roads, new charging points, additional parking spaces. It has a very good uh, also environmental impacts because it's maximizing value of used materials. It's reducing climate impacts and pollution, but still uh, a lot of time will be lost in, tra in the traffic. Or if we would go through optimizing delivery of human need, we are measuring and aiming to optimize mobility. Then this needs to reduce need for mobility and optimal access to mobility based on reduced energy and material needs, which leads to optimized infrastructure due to human needs focus, model shift, higher utilization of vehicles, reduced land use, health and wealth benefits, reduced pollution, environmental impacts, and of course also to the reduced time lost in traffic. So I think it's no brainer that the blue way is much better than the red way. But it's no brainer also that we are more or less uh, still uh, following the red way than the blue way. Finally, we will complement supply with demand side also, as I mentioned, connecting resource use to equity and justice related implications. We will not talk only about high income countries versus low income countries, but highest consumers everywhere are responsible for the situation in which we are. So, these are, the, again, the type of uh, pictures which you will be able to see. Climate change, high-income countries comparing to upper-middle, lower-middle, low-income countries on all provisioning systems. And this is the biodiversity story. So I will not go into detail. One could use practically the whole hour to talk about what you see in front of you. But this is just a teaser. So we will also see that uh, practically uh, also, oh, sorry, that practically uh, uh, all, uh, all here, even in very high income countries, the only shift which we see is for the climate impacts, which are starting to go down. The rest is still very much going up. High income countries and the others, it's pretty obvious, it's still going uh, pretty much in the same direction. To conclude, science is clear, the change is unavoidable, and there are a few basic shifts which I think are essential. First, we would need to shift from humans, which are currently seen pretty much in function of economic success and development, to an economy which would be in function to deliver human needs. So we need to set the order right. Second, we need to move from an economy which is currently considering us humans as external and superior to nature, to an economy acknowledging that we are embedded with nature. 
because the, destroying nature is simply destroying ourselves. We need to move from an extraction-based production to a creation-based production. We should stop stimulating extraction-based economic success and reward responsible, innovative, creative ways of meeting human needs. And finally, we should move from egoistic, short-term-based interest governance structures and logic to cooperation, to sharing sovereignty. Improving our collective resilience is a must. And we need a kind of convincing intergenerational pact because it's mainly about future generations, how they will live. Many are saying, uh, and since this is connected also to you, to uh, current and future business leaders, that, the, that, that this is contradictory to the business interest. But let me use the World Economic Forum top 10 risks and their survey, which is based on the inputs from major business leaders, which are the 10 major risks uh, in the 10 years perspective. First, Failure to mitigate climate change. Second, failure to climate change adapt adoption. Third, natural disasters and extreme weather events. Fourth, biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse. And sixth, natural resource crisis. So in short, it is getting green. And business leaders do better actually than policy leaders understand how important that is for their and your economic success. So I would like to end by pointing to that, that transformation is simply not about environmental sustainability. You know, access and use of natural resources in human history has been always closely related to the level which countries have achieved in well-being. But unfortunately, access to land, water, oil, gas, minerals, metals have also been reasons for stability, security conflicts, wars, and so on. And the whole history of this colonization of nature is also central to fairness and equity. So changing our relationship with the rest of nature is ultimately an economic equity, security imperative to strengthen collective resilience. And it will be resolved only in two possible ways. One is with collective wisdom and cooperation, or it will be resolved in a hard and painful way which is conflicts, migration, pandemics, and so on. As I said from the beginning, the future will be green or there will be no future. Ending with two quotes, and I think that Gordana will like this most because it's coming from the Alan Ford that is most famous comics from ex Yugoslavia, which is nicely explaining the current rules of, of and established practice where the economic system in which we are living are leading us is basically saying something like that. It's not a problem to drive without the brakes, the problem is to stop. And the second quote, it's coming, and with that I'm finishing my travel. It's coming from, uh, since I'm located currently in Belgium, from the most famous Belgium. It's, of course, uh, our detective Hercule Poirot. When he was once asked why he is speaking about himself, always in the third person, he replied something like that. If one is such a genius like me, like myself, it is very important to establish a healthy distance to himself. So, yes. That is the major challenge of each generation which is living on the planet. Can we establish healthy distance to ourselves? Can we consider that we are not the only one which are living on that planet and not the last one which is living on that planet? Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. That is a lot of food for thought. How is our how are our viewers doing? Please um start you can put your questions into the q a and in the meantime i'll start with uh, uh, or continue with our my own questions yes um so the social economic uh, or the social tipping points are uh, or have been a problem even uh, before because we for the first time in history we have uh, more people fleeing their country because of conflicts than ever before in in human history and this these numbers were before the ukrainian and israeli um hamas war so these numbers uh, are going to get worse Things you mentioned, of course, finance and the systemic vision that uh, our policymakers lack systemic vision. We discussed this in a previous webinar. The systemic vision also uh, requires patience because system, systemic change doesn't happen overnight. And we live in a world where we get the information at our finger 
tips all every single moment. And in addition to that, uh, you also mentioned financing, how much uh, money goes into subsidizing into the subsidies for fossil fuels. I was just at an investor conference in Vienna last few days, returned last night, and the circular economy is also treated still as a side notice because everything is about artificial intelligence. We like to, to distract ourselves. Um, and of course, technology can help us. We have questions about that. But what I'm trying to say is um, you were involved in the European Green Deal and the Circular Economy Action Plan. How much of that is there, how much vision uh, is there, the systemic vision in your opinion? Does it go far enough in a systemic vision? And, and mm -hmm. is enough money, is enough liquidity uh, there for the for this transition versus fossil fuels? Yeah, uh, European Green Deal, it's a visionary document. It's uh, actually, if I compare it to my times when I was a member of the commission, at that time would not be impossible. And uh, it's obviously that we are moving ahead, that there is a higher level of understanding of the necessary change. Uh, I have tried to explain that the whole system change compass is basically talking about that, that uh, there are some things which would need to, where we would need to go deeper uh, with the European Green Deal if we would want to make it implementable. But you have said one sentence in your question, which for me is quite a, critical and decisive question. You said systemic vision requires patience. But I will now explain you uh, uh, that it actually does not need to be like that. Let's take the COVID example. So how have we, so one lesson from COVID, first lesson is if it's necessary, we react because we see it as necessary. The second lesson which we can learn from the COVID is that we react only when it's absolutely necessary. So you will remember that in Europe, it was, ah, something is starting in China. Oh, yeah, there is something in uh, Africa. Oh, that's something in Italy. It's not in our, in my country. And then finally, when it hit all countries, uh, it was a bit late. So it's always a bit late, but we took it seriously. That's also a clear lecture. Uh, can we do some serious system changes quickly, would we be able to work from home today if there would not be COVID in 2019? No, because we learned that that is possible. It's actually useful. And there it's much less traveling. It's uh, very much resource efficient. And of course, I'm not saying that all the conferences, everything should not be, should be held in that way. On the contrary, but I think some rationality in that it's absolutely necessary. So it makes no sense to travel for 15 minutes speech or something uh, uh, somewhere across the Atlantic. So uh, again, changes are possible. And one super nice example from the COVID, it's also when it comes to human needs, which I was, uh, as you have heard, talking a lot about them. So ask yourself a simple question. How much of the clothes you were wearing during the COVID comparing to the period before COVID? <laughs> and and then when you, I, I know your answer, and then ask yourself uh, an even more important question. Were you more lucky or less lucky, uh, uh, happy, sorry, uh, than before? So somehow, sometimes we are pretty much, uh, uh, pretty much uh, manipulated by these external uh, needs which are created, which are, of course, then the resource intensive and there it's a uh, there is a side effect and consequence of that. And we will simply have to rethink some of those things. But you know what is unfortunate, uh, last conclusion from this COVID travel is that we are not taking climate change yet seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, or we would act in a different way than we are. By the way, this year in Slovenia, summer was devastating. So first, I, I haven't seen something like that. Uh, first, it was... Uh, uh, storms and bad weather, but not that we would have one storm. It was a month and a half of storms, which were repeating on each two, three days. And these were the storms like in uh, Psy Fifth movies. So you look to the sky, which was entirely dark and lightning was connected. So it was bright sky. And then suddenly stops the, the wind come with enormous power and the trees were falling like matches. So, and that happened a few times, you know. And, and then the uh, flooding. 
and then the flooding came. So, you know, if you face that, then, you know, I'm, I'm constantly trying that we would understand. And then everybody was, uh, a lot of people were, of, of course, affected. And uh, then uh, Slovenian community, international community, in particular European, uh, we had the visit of van der Leyen, we had the visit of Charles Michel, and everybody reacted with solidarity. Yeah. But why? We need exposed solidarity and we are not able to agree about ex ante solidarity because that's the real question, you know. If we would be able to agree, because uh, when you look to that and now, of course, we all talk, we have to be better prepared because we will be hit also in the future, we know. Mm -hmm. But that is the cost already, the cost of inaction from the past. Yeah. And that inaction from the past, it's costly. And uh, the financial means which you are talking about, you know, the financial sector should start to understand, I think it's it's slowly getting there, that managing the risks, it's not just managing their profits of the next year. We as humanity have much serious collective risks and they are as much from them, their responsibility to manage as they are the responsibility of policymakers. And if they don't get on board, dream on, because we will simply not go through that transformation. Uh, yeah, you're you're mentioning uh, a few interesting things. Yes, I just drove through your country last night. The mobility hasn't changed. <laughs> the outer route was still full with uh, exactly like if this, all these challenges didn't happen. As you said, we need mobility. We don't need more cars um, on the road. Uh, the but, but systemic change. If you if you open any business or economic newspaper, you will read about growth. Uh, which has been our mantra for, uh, and it has been, uh, it has some positive sides. I mean, we know from, from emerging countries that uh, middle class, uh, we are building a middle, middle, millions of people bringing into a middle class, which, uh, and escaping poverty, which uh, it's not everything negative about that. But if you open, if you open any newspaper, you will hear about um, the growth and if companies, uh, we, we, we saw some examples of companies transitioning to the circularity maybe too fast, not communicating with their shareholders or stay, all stakeholders properly and being, being punished for that um, in the process. Um, so the stock price going down uh, because they were not delivering enough growth uh, for their investors. So there is a, a larger issue here for companies and for, of course, our viewers who are, who are future leaders of these companies. How do we uh, manage that within a system that is programmed, literally programmed for growth? Yeah, that's the essence of the problem. You know, in uh, 1928, when Kuznets introduced the GDP concept, uh, he was clear that this is not the concept for measuring well-being. And we are still using it for the measuring well-being, basically. But uh, basically, the GDP concept, it's measuring the amount of goods and services which we put on the market. So it's uh, you are entirely right that uh, a lot of the world, in particular uh, the countries where these social needs haven't yet been met, need a very high economic growth. And... Uh, I think uh, I would not even put myself into the degrowth camp uh, because, because you, in, in particular, if you look at it from the global perspective, but in saturated economies like we are in the uh, European Union, I think fundamental question would be, let's start, let, let us agree first that it is economic growth, it's important. And you said rightly that it's giving us uh, many of the possibilities of, but I have very nicely explained in my lecture that all those needs could be met in different ways, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean that that also one would need economic, one would be in economically worse position. So if I, and, and I think, you know, the problem is that while we are behaving rationally on the short term, actually this rationality on the long term, it's entirely irrational. And it's yeah. leading us exactly where we are. Yeah. And uh, I think, uh, if, if I give you just uh, one uh, nice example, I have a refrigerator here behind me. So it's my property, yeah? So when uh, we can prove with the figures that those that the refrigerator which you are buying today, it's actually lasting less 
than it was the one which was bought 30 years ago yeah or or washing machine or whatever so producer it's creating their profit on the basis of amount of refrigerators which are sold to consumers and of course it's not interested that they last longer as necessary in a way uh, this is of course uh, somehow a kind of agreement between the producers and it's uh, also not interested that it's uh, repairable uh, that you can upgrade it or whatever uh, because uh, in, in many cases repairing it is more costly than buying new today and and of course this has a consequences on the amount of the resources which we are consuming exactly. and on the impacts on climate change and so on so exactly imagine yeah. imagine that that refrigerator would not be my property that it would be the property of the company still which has produced it so suddenly this would be their cost not their profit and yeah. they would be they would be interested from the very beginning to design it totally differently so exactly. in that case we would not need uh, we would not need ecosystem that eco design directive as we all want it in european union and uh, we see it as an efficient tool if the market would actually work in the direction which would from the beginning incentivize producers to design the system in a different way so that it's less but they would be still selling me by the way uh, for example 10 euros for cooling my food but yeah. that doesn't mean that their profit Service, will be low, yes you know so a lot of those things could be done, uh, yeah. which would actually lead us to the world, which is different than today, which could still incentivize uh, producers, give them the possibility of profits. And uh, uh, there are many of those solutions. That's why you remember I was mentioning ownership as one of the problems. You know, also in, in housing, ownership, it's a serious problem. Because yeah, at yeah. least if you, if you go to rural areas, a lot of houses are empty today. Yeah, and exactly. uh, you see how, how you can change that. If you would have more... I, I rather not mention the name uh, social ownership because it's immediately like uh, it's it's uh, it's something which is not as good as uh, private ownership. But if if we would have more of that managed with a bit of more public uh, interest, so that somebody would take care that it's upgradable, that it's stone, that it's never empty, and so on, a lot could be saved. Yes. So uh, it's it's just it's just uh, yeah, of course it's. It needs a different system, but currently GDP, which is our North Star, it's basically not leading us to North. Yes, that, that it, there are several suggestions, but this has to be adopted globally. And of course, there is a lot of resistance to that. Um, and as you rightfully said, I mean, uh, companies need to generate profits. I mean, the first first term of the, if you go back to the old term of the responsibility, first term is the economic responsibility so to sustain itself as a financially in the first place, because this creates jobs. Um, and pays taxes um, and so on and so on. So there are benefits to that. But when you mention the product as a service, there is um, there is an issue that we are facing in Europe, and this is a systemic problem that we, uh, if we want to offer products as a service, they break in a process. But who is going to replace? Who is going to repair this? We have a law of repair in European Union, but we face the educational problem that yep, we don't because... have enough. But not people interested in repairing things. Listen, in my youth, it was different. Yes. And uh, we had a lot of people who knew, who knew how to repair the things. And some of the things, uh, so I know we were joking from, uh, I don't know, uh, Beijing, uh, that they are all driving the, the bicycles and now we are all stimulating uh, that we would drive the bicycles in our city. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some of the things, uh, some of the things which we have learned uh, in the past are not, uh, and so not everything is living better and technological uh, uh, development, uh, which actually looks like that at the very beginning. And uh, that's why my plea was always, I'm, I'm a firm, firm believer in technological development and solutions. But, you know, if we have, if we do not simultaneously change our our drivers of economic system, listen, this will not, we will not fix the things uh, which are basically driving us in, in all the side effects which we have mentioned during, uh, uh, during our lecture. And when you have said at the beginning that it needs to be adopted globally, of course, it needs to be at the end adopted globally. 
But who will lead? Do you expect uh, the low-income countries to lead? Come on. We are those who are living, who have actually profited in the past, also due to the fact that we were, uh, that we were um, using the resources of those South countries, not leaving value added to those poor people down there. And uh, today relationships are relationships which are based on some historical developments. Mm. And we are bound to lead and at the same time do everything that on the global level this would be followed and changed. And uh, I'm, I, I, you, you remember that I have said, uh, started uh, that, that we are more interconnected and interdependent and that it's only cooperation which should, uh, which should basically lead us. And we would need a kind of broader, more global agreements linked to circularity, linked to the use of resources. Absolutely, we would need that. No, so absolutely. what we are pleading, for example, uh, in now in the Global Resource Outlook, uh, it's asking for something like Global Resource uh, uh, Institute or, or institution, which would actually be working together and giving a clear advice to policymakers all around the world, how in the resource use we should behave in the in particular in material use because uh, uh, unfortunately as it is currently and you are rightly saying uh, everybody is trying to to look at themselves trying to see oh uh, we will uh, we will lose comparing to the others and then we are losing all together and uh, if we yeah. are losing all together i don't know what is the benefit for us Yes, exactly. Exactly. I think we could continue for another few hours discussing this topic. Our time is up. Um, thank you so much, Yanis, uh, for a very insightful um, presentation and uh, all these numbers bringing to us uh, back again to reality that we need to uh, react now from the policymaker side. But of course, companies have the power to push uh, for more change and progressive Indeed. companies actually ask policymakers to, um, as we were seeing in the uh, UK, ask policymakers to progress on this and not to not yeah. to go back and go, not to go step back. So there I is have a showed lot you the attention. World Economic Forum uh, um, where the companies are seeing major risks. And I think that needs to be taken into account also by the policymakers, by the way. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today to this uh, second webinar. Next month, uh, in November, we are going to China. But we are going to look for solutions where for companies where you would not expect them. So join us again in, um, uh, in November for our next webinar, a multifaceted path to sustainability. And thank you. Thank you, Anis. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you for the opportunity. All the best.